I want to find the flow of what God wants us to do. And, and it's not always, I, I try not to plan ahead. I mean, there's things that I know God has impressed into my spirit. And likely, you know, we'll talk about those things. But I want to tell you a quick story. And this has nothing to do with where I think we're going today. Um, preacher friend of mine calls me up and he was listening to this other pastor that was preaching and this other pastor who I, I have met, I have the highest regard for him. He is a, a Bible student. He is a, he's older than I am by quite a number of years. And he made this statement. He said, Jesus is a destination. And I've thought about that a lot. Jesus is my destination. I, I am going I want to get to Jesus. I I want to push all the junk of the earth, the world, everything that would get in my way, and I want to get to that destination of Jesus Christ. That's where I want to be. So we're driving to church this morning, and it's quiet in the car. Um, Richard's in the car, my wife and I. My wife was getting some stuff ready for the kids this morning. And I felt the Holy Ghost speak to me and said, I'm going to paraphrase. If I am the destination, then I am heaven. That Jesus is heaven. And it, it really struck me, and I, I've just been sitting here this whole time while we've been worshiping, thinking, I've got to get to Jesus. If I'm going to make it to heaven, I have to come into him. And what does the Bible talk about? About Jesus died on the cross, right? We know that story. But why did he die? He died so that we might live, right? But according to the word of God, Paul says this, I die daily. That's what he said. He's dying out in the flesh, and he's surrendering his spirit to Jesus Christ, that God might do the living through us. And I will tell you, I just, I'm so encouraged by what the Lord is doing. I'm so thankful when I walk into a place like this that I I not only feel the presence of God, but I understand where my destination is. He is my destination. He is the one that I am shooting for. He is the one that I am striving for. And as I get into him, I experience heaven on earth because I experience the power of God manifest in my life. I will tell you, you know, God has spoken to me this week on several things. And I will tell you, I love the community with God because he is my destination. He is the one that I am searching for. And so today, I know this is a little unusual, but I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet with me. And I'm going to ask us to do something that we don't normally do in a service, but we're walking in and and into the service. We, We entered into his courts with thanksgiving, into his gates with praise. We've done that. But as you're coming into the tabernacle, What's the very first thing that you run into? You run into the altar of sacrifice. You run into the place where they put something on the altar and they sacrificed it and you could not get to the next step. You couldn't get to the water until you'd pass through the fire. The fire is a place of death. It's a place of sacrifice. And so what I'm going to ask us to do today, I'm just going to ask us to reach out to God this morning. And I just want you to repent. I don't want you to scream out. If you murdered anybody last night, do not scream it out here. But, you know, just say, Lord, you know, you know what's in my heart and I want you to forgive give me. So let's just all lift our voice in our hands right here. Lord Jesus, I, I'm coming to that altar right now. I'm coming to that place, God. Lord, I, I want to throw myself. I'm casting myself upon that altar. Lord, I want to be a burnt offering to You that, God, the things of this world would be burnt out of me. That, God, they would be, Lord, removed from me. And that, God, the only thing that God is in me, Lord, is left is Your Spirit living through me. I repent, God, of any wrong thought, any wrong word, any wrong action, any wrong attitude. Uh, Lord, I just cast myself fully, completely, and wholly upon You today. Lord, I I give You the glory because, Lord, I know this. As I come to that altar of sacrifice, that, God, You are faithful and You are just to forgive me for my sins. And so, Lord, as I stand in this place, I believe I stand cleansed. I believe that I stand clean before You. So, God, I pray one more thing. That, God, as we enter into this, Lord, I I pray, God, turn me into a donkey. Lord, turn me into a donkey. Lord, I surrender my mouth and I surrender my voice to You. And I pray, God, that You would use it and that, God, You would send it out, Lord, and penetrate hearts where, Lord, You see fit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, why don't you clap your hands to the Lord? 
Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. So, a uh, fairly easy book to figure out. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 6. And if you're having trouble finding chapter 6, it comes right after chapter 5. Uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. I'm trying to be a help. Exactly, exactly. If anybody has any problems, we'll get Selena out there. She's, she's in school, so she can help. She knows all this. She's an amazing young lady. I'm so thankful for, uh, uh, for Connor, right? What's your name? Mason. It's almost Connor. It's almost the same. But we're thankful that Mason's here. <laughs> And he came with his brother today. And I'm thankful for every one of you. Um, Tony and, and Kareem and Selena, we don't consider you guests anymore. So we're just thankful that you're part of this. So, okay, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. If you've got it, why don't you stand up with me so I know that we're there. I'm going to read several verses to you this morning. The uh, Bible says this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his thoughts, of his heart, was evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man of whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. And verse 8 is almost a standalone verse, but it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then it goes on and gives the generations of Noah um, in the next two verses. And so go down to verse 11, and it says this, The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. He said, therefore, after that, verse 14, he said, make an ark of gopher wood. Room shall you make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without uh, pitch. And this is the fashion that you shall make of the ark, the length of it. And then you go on to verse 16, and it says, And there's going to be a window to the ark, and it shall be a cubit, and you shall finish it above. And the door of the ark shall be in the, set in the side thereof, and the lower, second, and third stories shall you make. And behold, I... Even I do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under the heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee, Noah, but with you, will I establish my covenant. And you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with thee. Thank the Lord. Take your Bibles and put them down right now. And just begin to lift your voice and begin to lift your hands one more time unto the Lord. Let's just celebrate the things of God. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Jesus, that God, you took the time, Lord, to give us, Lord, this incredible love letter that tells us who you are and tells us your desire, Lord, to pull us near to you. Lord, I honor you and I give you glory and honor today in Jesus' name. Now clap your hands to the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank the Lord. I was praying while Ezekiel was uh, screaming over here. I said, God, fill the house with the voices of the children. I just, I love hearing those kids uh, moving around and having a good time in church. So these verses we just read, um, Rev, uh, Genesis, you know, 1, 2, and 3 go pretty fast. Creation, and then you get to the garden, and you get to the fall of mankind. And then in two chapters, you get to the destruction of the earth. Uh, you, you get there very, very quickly. And um, there's some things that we have left to tradition to understand um, I'll talk about that in a second, I believe. But, you know, there's truly not a lot of information given uh, to us about Noah and Noah's Ark. But one thing is very apparent, that when Adam and Eve, when they fell in the garden, 
it was God's desire to still continue to deal with humanity. Um, you know, the Lord, we know what happened to Satan, and we know what happened to his angels. That bang, they were just cast down. Once, once um, iniquity was found in heaven, it was immediately cast down. And I, I'm, this is a rabbit trail here, but I'm going to just say this. Um, when you read the story about uh, Satan, and there's not a ton written about him, but what's found about him is that he had iniquity in his heart, and he was cast down. And what iniquity is, is purely not doing the will of God. It's purely uh, a will other than the will of God. And I'll show you that here a little later. And I already got twisted up and who knows where we're going from here. But anyway, uh, there's not room in heaven for two wills. There is no room in heaven for my will. Uh, Lord, my will and your will together. That's not how it works. Jesus is a king. He is a sovereign king. And the Bible says that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and I will tell you, it was the same in the Old Testament. God's desire was to deal with humanity in its entirety. But there came a point where the Lord just said, you know what, I, I've had it. I've had it with humanity. Now, I think I've shared this. I, I know I've shared this with you. I, I don't know if all of you have heard this, but I, I was laying in bed one morning. It was a Saturday morning, and I was awake early. The sun was already up, just going back to the middle of this last summer, and uh, probably at you know the longest part of our days. And so the sun's up fairly early, and I was laying in bed, and the Lord started putting something in my mind, and I didn't realize immediately that it was the Lord, but he took me back to the Garden of Eden. And at the garden, he showed me the, the fall of mankind. Uh, and, you know, ladies, I, I'm going to just say this. If, if any men ever start giving you a hard time about, well, Eve ate the, ate the fruit, or if they say they ate the apple, you just tell them this. Eve argued she was in the middle of spiritual warfare for like four or five verses. Adam, in a half a verse, surrendered and gave it all up. I mean, you talk about the strength of ladies. Uh, ladies, as a matter of fact, we see it in the church all the time. When you talk about prayer, when you talk about finding the things of God, ladies are typically the first ones to come and, and to be involved in those things. And we see it all throughout Scripture. But anyway, there's the fall of Adam and Eve, and, and you read the story, and the Lord comes, Adam, where art thou? And, I mean, God never asks the question that he doesn't know the answer to. He already knew the answer to the question. And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked. Well, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? And God didn't need the answer. He already knew the answer. But it was at that moment in time, uh, the snake got cursed, the lady got cursed, the man got cursed, the ground got cursed. Uh, I mean, it, it was a bad deal in the garden that day, right? And, and the man gets cast out. I say, man, I mean, Adam and Eve, they're cast out. And this is where my mind went that day. And I, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about the troubles of Adam. I'm thinking about how he's cast out of the garden, how now he's got to toil just to survive. He has to figure out how to grow things, and he has to figure out how to uh, survive in life when really he was completely taken care of before. And, and uh, how the voice of God would come to him, and he would hear God, and he would talk to God, and, and how uh, he would communicate with God. And, and matter of fact, uh, so anyway, um, so I'm thinking about all this stuff. Well, then... Uh, there's Jewish legend that, that is not Bible, but it's just legend. And it starts to play like a movie in my mind. And I start to see uh, some of this legend that I, I had read about, the, the legend of their eyes. They, they had fleshly eyes, or the eyes that we have today. But back in the garden, legend says that they had eyes that could see into the spirit. And I believe some of that's true because the Bible says that the Lord would come down. He would visit with them. You know, I think they saw things that humanity doesn't necessarily see. I think they heard things that humanity doesn't necessarily hear. I mean, we know that Eve had a conversation with a snake and she didn't flip out. Uh, it, was, it, it seemed to be kind of just a normal day when she's talking to a snake. I know this. If a snake rolls up in our house and speaks to my wife, there will be a lot of shooting, yelling, hollering, stomping, and... and by the time I get my wife off the top of my head uh, to figure out what's going on, it's just not normal. But yet for Eve, it was normal. And so I think there's something to what they saw, 
They, I think they saw deeper things than we see. Matter of fact, she had a conversation with that, that snake, and then by the time Cain and Abel, the Bible says, it, it, you know, the, in the process of time, that man began to call upon the name of the Lord again. Well, you know, Cain brought the, the fruit of the ground, and, and Cain brought his offering. And we don't read anything about the offering. Say, hold on here, Abel, don't do it, don't do it. We, we don't read about that anymore. Well, it seems to be a thing of the past. And so God's laying this on my mind, and I'm, I'm just kind of reliving this. And then, according to Jewish legend, that Adam and Eve got so desperate for the things of God that they went back to the garden. And um, we know that the Lord had set an angel with a flaming sword there. According to legend, the rivers got all rerouted and they couldn't get back and the angel was standing against them. And so they were so desperate that they cast themselves into the river thinking it's better to die than to be without God. And, and the angel picked them up and sent them back on their way and would not allow them to kill themselves. Now, that's Jewish legend. I'm not telling you it's true. I'm just telling you it's legend. But as I'm thinking about this, the Lord speaks to me. And I'll tell you, it's, it's so clear to me what the Lord said this day as it was that day. He said that's the way, and he was talking about preachers, and he was talking about pastors and ministers that preach this story. He said that's the way everybody preaches it, but nobody tells it from my side. And I knew right there that God was sharing his emotions with me. Okay, I, I mean, I, well, I shouldn't say right there. I had to consider this for a while. But God was sharing his deep emotions to be connected with humanity. He, he was sharing me, uh, with me the, the love of God toward man, how God had to, he had to banish what he loved so very much, separate it out and, and remove it from his presence. And I just thought, oh, God, have mercy. You know, it, it's a terrible thing. And I think about, how much I love my wife, and you know, I'm not trying to uh, say I ever want this to happen, but, but what if I had to send my wife away? It would be horrible. It would be traumatic. I, I couldn't deal with that. And yet, here's what God was faced with. He was faced with separating himself from the nature of sin. I, I'm going to tell you this. No man, no man, no man, no man can stand before God in our sinful nature. I mean, when Adam, when he had the knowledge of sin, when he had the understanding of sin, he could not come to God and stand there. And, you know, the Bible tells us that the heart of man is just continually wicked. He couldn't stand there with those imaginations, and he couldn't stand there with those understandings. And God said this, he said, you've got to go. He said, it's not that I don't love you. I love you very much, but if you stay, you will die. You will not be able to stay in the presence of God. And so God puts him out of the garden. And I know just as sad as Adam was and just as sad as Eve was, that God was literally broken hearted as he shared those emotions with me. I'm going to tell you, our God loves us so very, very, very much. It's unbelievable the amount of love that comes forth from heaven. And God has really uh, gotten a hold of me over the past couple of months and dealt with me about the love of God. And I I'll tell you something. Something. I wish I could tell you I understand it. I wish I could tell you that I really understood the depths of the love of God. But what I can tell you is the love of God is flowing to mankind. It has been flowing to mankind ever since the day that Adam and Eve were run out of the garden. It has never stopped flowing. But what has happened is that mankind, and the Bible tells us this in chapter 6 and verse 5, uh, that the heart of man is continually evil and wicked. We don't have anything but wicked and evil imagination imaginations and thoughts and I'm telling you today that when God looked at that he said you know what I am sorry that I ever even created man I mean literally this is what's happened and so the Lord said this he said it repented me now, now you read it and I read it I should have never done it I should have never created man I should have never done any of this stuff and the Bible says this that he said, I'm going to destroy all of mankind. Now, I'm going to tell you, that day, that particular day, there was a hit list that went out, and it had every name on the earth on it. Every name. Matter of fact, everything that took breath was on that list for destruction. And we came to that one verse. I believe Noah's name was on that list as well. But verse 8 says this, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, that's a remarkable statement to come up right here, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God was so mad he was going to destroy everything. Um, but Noah found grace. Now, the, the term grace, we like to throw that around in Christendom. 
We like to throw that around. Oh, I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by grace. Absolutely, we are saved by grace. But what is grace? What is grace? Well, the only way I know to define it is it's God's love in action toward us. Now, that's a, that, we, we think that's such an easy statement, but you have to understand something. Grace is God's empowerment. When God opens up Scripture to us and, and gives us a vision for things, that's the grace of God. He's showing us things. He's leading us. He's pulling us. But then when we're walking through life and we're, we're confronted with a temptation and we pray, God, you've got to help me. You've got to help me. It's God's empowerment to us to overcome, to live an overcoming life. Grace is so very, very powerful. I'm going to tell you, I, I've started praying this uh, on a regular basis. God, give me grace to stand in the day. God, give me grace to stand today. Give me grace to stand tomorrow. Give me grace that I might die out to myself, that the things of God might flow through me. Lord, I know this, that, that if people look at me and this is what they see, it's a pretty ugly sight. But God, if somehow the things of God can flow out of me, if I can die out enough that God can flow through me and touch hearts and touch lives around me, then that grace of God will will begin to flow into communities. It will begin to flow into, let me just say this, the world. I was sitting out in my driveway, and God showed me something. He allowed me to see, I just believe it was miles and miles away. I believe I was looking 50 to 75, maybe 100 miles down. I was looking into the plains of Iowa, out toward the uh, past, three quarters of the way out into Iowa, way past, um, way past Fort Dodge. And I saw this cloud that literally filled my vision from side to side. It filled my vision. If I look left and right, I could see past it. But that cloud was pouring out of heaven. And when it hit the earth, it was just splashing out and it was filling the earth. I will tell you, the grace of God is so big and it is flowing into the earth and it wants to touch everything. But I'm telling you today that if Jesus is a destination, then heaven is Jesus and we've got to get a hold of this Jesus. We can't walk past Him. We can't say, well, bless God, I'm going to come to church, chalk me up for one God and get me a nice place in heaven. I want a nice house when I get to heaven. No, 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 no. It's about us falling in love with the Savior. It's about us turning to God with everything we have. That God, You are my Savior. You are my life. You are my hope. Lord, You're the one that I'm dying out to and God today I'm going to bow my knee and today I'm going to bow my heart and today I'm going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord praise God clap your hands to the Lord thank the Lord and so the Bible tells us that the earth was corrupt before God and it was filled with violence there's two reasons violence and corruption that God um, destroyed the earth but what was the corruption well, the Bible tells us that, that mankind, all of flesh, had corrupted his way upon the earth. His way upon the earth. Okay? And so, the things of God. You've got to remember, Adam and Eve were not that far removed. They were not that far uh, down the road. We know the story of Enoch. He walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Okay? There was an awareness of God. There was an awareness of the kingship of the Lord God Almighty. But yet mankind, in a couple of short generations, and I know the generations were longer, but in a couple of short generations, they had completely turned away from the things of God. I will tell you this, that the generations of this earth are so dependent upon those that are making Jesus their destination. They are so dependent on the grace of God flowing from us. Because I will tell you, there's more corruption in the earth. I believe there's more corruption in the earth. I wasn't there then. But I will say this, that I believe there's a lot more people on the earth today. I believe there's a lot more sin upon the earth today. I believe there's a lot more communication in the world today. I believe that our ability to seek rottenness and and corrupt things is a lot more available than it was back in their day. And yet, God destroyed the entire earth. Matter of fact, as I said, I believe every name was put on a hit list that day, and it was only because one man found grace in the eyes of the Lord that he said, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I, I will tell you, God has called me uh, to a covenant. I remember when I first came here, uh, the Lord called me in my kitchen. And he was talking to me and dealing with me about building a church. And it's not my job to build a church. It's his. The Bible says this, those that build a house, uh, or those, 
those that build the house without the Lord, I'm paraphrasing, they labor in vain. Or lest the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. God is the house builder. But my job, as he pointed out to me, was to teach, to preach, to minister to people, to let the word of God go forth. Why? So that grace could go forward. So that salvation could come. Because the salvation of God is dependent upon the flow of God's spirit. It's dependent upon the things of God touching other hearts and minds. And I will tell you today that God has called each and every one of you to a place of ministry. He's called each and every one of you to a place where my neighbor, he is the one that God has set me over. My neighbor is the one that I'm supposed to preach to. The one in the grocery store, the one in the gas station. God has ordained them to walk across my path in life. And I've got to let that grace flow. Why don't you clap your hands to the Lord right now? Amen. I believe the Bible teaches this. We, we read about Noah in the book of Hebrews. It says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, I, I told you before and, and that a lot of what we have uh, is tradition. Okay, Tradition says Noah spent 120 years building the ark and preaching. It's not in the Bible. Matter of fact, most scholars think 60 to 70 years took him to build the ark. Some say 20. There's others that say 500. I think I read 500 somewhere. But anyway, some think it took a lot longer. It doesn't really matter to me the number. But the Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Okay? He found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he was a preacher of righteousness. I don't, you don't have to believe this, but I'm going to tell you what I think. I don't think that Noah had a portable pulpit that he took to town with him every Sunday and set it up and started preaching. I don't think he did that. I think what he did, what is righteousness? It's submission to God. It's humility before God. And God said this, Noah, build an ark. I don't ever read any question where Noah said, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? I don't read anything about that. What I read about is Noah building an ark. What I read about is Noah submitting to the Lord God Almighty and said, yes, God, I will do what you ask. Do I think there were people that walked by and said, Noah, what are you doing? I'm building a boat. Noah, you're an idiot. Might be, but God said to do it, and I'm going to do it. And I will tell you that, that when our faith is challenged, when, when people come and say, well, why do you do this? Why do you go to church? I, I mean, come on. Well, Loretta, when you were young, I bet people went to church every single Sunday. Like, they, they didn't miss. But I'll tell you, today, in today's day and age, it, it is, well, you know, bless God, my toenails need trimming, and i got to stay home, and i got to do this, and i got to do that. And, and so, so many things are good getting put on the backside. Why? What is happening? Corruption is coming into the world. The ways of God are being corrupted. We don't no longer have a fear of God. I, I'll tell you, I read something about some stuff about the early 1900s and what was happening in the Methodist church, what was happening in the Pentecostal church, even what was happening in the Baptist church. There was a sovereign move of God. There was revival happening where the Spirit of God was touching people, healing people. But there was a fear of God that had come upon the earth. And I will tell you something, that I have been and praying, and God has been leading me to this. I saw that cloud coming down, and I saw the things of God being poured out, but I sat there in the morning and said this, I release right now the fear of God to come back into the earth. Why? Because we got to get back to a place where we know Christ is sovereign, and He is the King, and He is the one that holds eternity into His hand. And I'll tell you something, that the church has forgotten about it, that the people of the world have forgotten about it, but I've come today to tell you that Jesus is the one. He is the destiny destination. He is heaven. He is all in all. And we've got to get back to a place where the fear of the Lord comes upon us. Praise God. Clap your hands to the Lord. We have this thing, tradition says. Noah went and preached. He told the world, but nobody would turn to God. Again, I don't think he had the fold-up pulpit. I think he just lived his life according to the principles of God. Because the Bible tells us specifically that when God established the ark, the plan of the ark, he made no accommodations for other people. He only made accommodations for Noah, his wife, and his six descendants, his three, three sons and three, three daughters-in-law. There was no accommodations. There was no, no plan that if some others come, was only for those eight. You know, I have preached and I have said publicly 
The scariest chapter in the Bible to me is Matthew chapter 7. Because the Lord is speaking, and he said this. He, he said, on that day, many are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, I cast out devils. I laid my hands upon the sick, and they recovered. I spoke in tongues. I did this. I worked in the soup kitchens. I, 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 I was a good person. I did all of this. And the Lord said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He said, get away. And then the very next verse, they come back, and they argue with him. And they said, but Lord, I told you. We prophesied. We spoke the word of God. We, we did all of these things. He said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He said, I never knew you. Leave me because you work iniquity. And how is it that I know you work iniquity? He said, because it's for those that do the will of my father. Which means, which means, people that were calling themselves Christians, people that were saying, I am a Christian, bless God, they were not doing the will of God. And God said, because of that, I never knew you. I will tell you something. We have to get back to a place where, where we understand, we understand that Jesus is king. Now, when the Lord spoke this, on that day, many are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord. He was not talking to the unsaved. He was talking to people that believed they were saved. He was talking to people who thought they were serving God in the church and that they were worshiping God in the church. He, he wasn't talking to people that had never had an, an experience with the Spirit of God. He was talking to people that had prophesied, laid their hands upon the sick, watched them recover, had done all these incredible things, but somehow they didn't make Jesus their destination. Somehow they didn't understand that heaven is Jesus and that we have to obtain... We we have to do everything we can to get a hold of this Jesus. The Bible says this, that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and violent men take it by force. I'll tell you something, we got to get back to a violent relationship with the kingdom of heaven. Remember uh, when Jacob ran away from his, dad, from his brother because his dad died and his brother wanted to kill him, that he wrestled all night with that angel, that he said, I am going to possess the things of God. I'll tell you something, we become such a whole hum group of people that we've forgotten about prayer. We've forgotten about fasting. We've forgotten about reading our Bible. We put all those things aside. And I'll tell you something, that the kingdom of God is looking for men and women that will get violent with the things of God and say, I've got to possess these things. Praise God. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord right now. The day and age in which we live. Just lift your hands right now and worship God for just a second. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I need so much more of you. I need so much more of you. I need so much more of you. Jesus spoke these words. He said, but that day and hour, speaking of the, the time of the end, the rapture of the church, that day and hour no man knows, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. The Lord is saying here, and he's relaying this story to the people and he's saying, listen, the days before Noah, he said they, life was just normal. They were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. There was nothing out of the normal. But suddenly there was something that changed and destruction came upon them. I'll tell you something. You read it. Okay, you don't have to believe me. The Bible's there and you can read it. But I will tell you, by the time you get into Revelation 8 and 9, you understand that there's some seriously bad stuff that's happening on the earth. You start connecting that with the book of Daniel and you start understanding that there are terrible things that are coming upon the earth. That there is sudden destruction that is about to come. And I will tell you that Jesus offered himself on that cross. He offered us a way out. I, I've heard, and you, got, you guys have all heard this story. Oh, would a loving God really send people to hell? God's not sending anybody to hell. It's a free choice. You choose where you're going to go. Jesus has only offered us a way out. He's given us an escape. You come to the cross. You come and, and have the blood applied. You put uh, the things of God into your life and salvation will come. I find it amazing that the Bible says this. So Jesus said, he, he said, uh, those of you that work iniquity, you're going, you're not going to make it. Okay. 
back in the, in the Old Testament, what we read. Scariest chapter in the Bible, Matthew chapter 7. Scariest number in the Bible, 8. He let the whole world die so that 8 could be saved through the flood. By the water, they were saved. I'll tell you something, there's something miraculous about water. When you get to uh, the book of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel says these words, chapter 40 and verse 1. It says, in the 5 and 20th year of captivity, that means 25 years after uh, Judah was carried off and brought into Babylon, in the 5 and 20th year of captivity, beginning at the year of the 10th month, in the 14th day after the city was smitten, in the selfsame day, the hand of the Lord was upon me. So God picked him up in captivity and literally brought him back to Jerusalem, uh, either in a vision or, uh, or completely physically there. And he brought me thither. And he said, in the visions of God, brought me into the land of Israel and set me upon a high mountain by which... Uh, the fame of the city was on, or the frame of the city was on the south, and he brought me thither. And behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, and a line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate. Uh, what happened was God brought him back to, to Jerusalem, and he said, "I'm sending an angel." And you read the story, the appearance of the angel is an incredible thing. Uh, and in one, uh, one place talks about how he looked like amber from the waist up, or, or maybe it was a different angel. Uh, from the waist up, he was amber, and from uh, the waist down, he was like fire. And this angel, uh, his appearance was like brass, and he, they were going to measure out the temple, right? Okay, so they, they go and they start measuring out the temple, and they came uh, to the way of the gate out of uh, outward... The, of the outward sanctuary, so middle, okay, the sanctuary, where the things of God are. And as you get down into chapter 44, you find this. And thou shalt say unto the rebellious. So let me just define this. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to the Levites. He's speaking to those that knew God or were supposed to knew, know God. He said, Unto the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you, or stop with all of your abominations, in that you have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house, when you, when you offer my bread and the fat and the blood, and you have broken in my covenant because of all your abominations and you sh you and you have not kept the charge of my holy things but you have set keepers of my charge of the sanctuary for yourselves he's saying this you come into church and you do whatever you want he said i've told you how to do this i've told you how to worship i've told you how to enter into the presence of god i've told you the requirements to get there but you have changed the path you have tried to take an easy way out you have tried to do it i'll tell you what i listen to these church these, these uh halfway churches all the time well bless god you just got to pray a prayer and god will uh, immediately write your name in the lamb's book of life where's that in the bible it's not there the bible says this you must be born again of the water and the spirit you You've got to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. There is a birth of water and there is a birth of spirit. And they are not the same thing. And the book of Acts confirms it time after time after time after time again. And I'll tell you something. we got to get back to the place where we find that salvation in water. And we find that salvation in spirit. And we move in the things that God gave us. Because in the Old Testament, God utterly destroyed the church. Because he was not happy with the direction it went. So, let me just fast forward a little bit. So Ezekiel goes to the temple, and they measure it all out. He sees the wickedness. A matter of fact, Ezekiel is just such a fascinating book to me. He sees all the wickedness that's happening, and he speaks the word of the Lord. But then you get to chapter 47, and this is where it gets so exciting for me. Chapter 47, he says this, Afterward, brought me again to the door of the house or to the door of the temple, okay? And behold, waters issued out or poured out from under the threshold of the house eastward for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out the way again of the gate northward and led me about the way without without unto the 
utter gate by the way that looked eastward. And behold, there ran waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth uh, eastward, and he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to my ankles, and again he measured a thousand, and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to my knees, and again he brought he measured a thousand, and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to my loins, and afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that could not be that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen waters to swim in a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, have you seen this? He said, listen, he said, I want you to look and understand that the waters are pouring forth out from the house of God. There is something that is flowing. Now let me just tell you, I, I'm just going to back up and this is not an original thought with me. I've heard this from Mark Morgan and if you've never heard Mark Morgan preach, Google him, find him. He's a great big guy, amazing preacher. But he said this, he said, if the waters came out of the house, they had to come out from under the throne of God. I, I will tell you that the Ark of the Covenant back in the Old Testament was literally God's throne upon earth. And I will tell you from the throne of God there are waters that are issuing out from the tabernacle, from the temple of God. And I will tell you that temple I believe resides in heaven. But the people of God, we become the conduit. We become the thing that that water or that spirit flows through. And in this context it's a metaphor for the spirit of the living God. I will tell you we've got to be born again of water. We've got to be baptized in Jesus name. We've got to be filled with the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues because that's what the word of God tells us has to happen and then every day we've got to pursue Jesus Christ as a destination I will tell you something the Bible says this that the angel of the Lord he measured a thousand and the water was to my ankles a thousand it was to my knees a thousand it was to my waist and a thousand I couldn't swim in it I, I think I've mentioned this to you before if you get in the water and you're ankle deep uh, that water can't move you you can't be budged you get into it up to your knees you can't be moved you can't be budged you get in to your waist you might feel the push of the water but chances are you can brace yourself whether you're at ankle deep knee deep waist deep water you can still resist the moving of God's spirit it's not until we get into the deep part of that water where the spirit of God can move us and can allow us to flow I told you when I started we got to die out to the things of this world we've got to give ourselves wholly totally completely to the Lord Jesus Christ he is the king of eternity and he is is calling his church saying won't you get into the deep waters Amen. praise God I, I, I don't mean to close on a negative but I want to take you down just a little bit further and the Bible says this in verse 11 chapter 47 and verse 11 it says but the miry places thereof and the marishes so let me translate in the swamps and marshes in the swampy places and the marshy places. Therefore shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. So, let me translate what I feel like God has spoken to me. Swamps and marshes in the spirit are this. They are places they clearly had water in them. They had water in them. But that water was not moving. It was stagnant. It would just lie flat. And I will tell you that we can get that way in the Spirit. We can move in those deep places of God, and then we can come to a point where we say, you know what, I've kind of had enough, and I've kind of felt enough of God's Spirit, and I'm just going to sit back, and I'm going to relax, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And hence, we get all the way up to Matthew chapter 7, where it says, uh, they said to me, Lord, Lord, we operated in the Spirit of God. We did the things we wanted to do. And the Lord said, nope, it's so much more than that. You've got to get caught up in the deep water. You have to allow God's Spirit to move you from left to right. You have to allow God's Spirit to push you into those deep waters. Places, you know what, I've gotten into some crazy places in the Spirit of God, and I'm not going to try to get into it, but there's times I've just started declaring things. I'll share this with you. Crazy, crazy. I'm sitting on that front, front seat last Monday night. Ron was here. We were praying together. And I heard the voice of God. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, for all of you in video land out there, you better buckle up. It's warning you. The Lord said this. He said, it's time to release the judgment of God into the earth. For through judgment, revival is going to come. I thought this, this was my reaction to God. I'm not saying a word. 
Because you know what? If I release judgment into the earth, that affects my house. That affects me. That affects where I'm at. I'll tell you, I went to some friends of mine. I said, brother, I said, I got to talk to somebody about this. I got to tell you what's happening. I got to tell you what the Lord spoke to me. And, and so I had two of them that I sat down with, and they both said the same thing. I believe that that is, I, I believe you've heard from God. So I started thinking about, and this is how, how it works for me. I, I'll sit there, and I, I start thinking through the Bible. I started thinking about the book of Judges, what happened. Judgment came. Why? It didn't come to destroy Israel. It came to bring them back into alignment with God. Judgment came in the New Testament. You read the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Judgment came to Ananias, and judgment came to Sapphira. They had a moment to repent, but when they chose not to repent, they died. But what happened to the church? That miracles, signs, and wonders, and great revival broke out. You want to talk about judgment? Turn to the first three chapters of the book of Revelation in the letters to the churches where the Lord says, listen, you better get it right or else life's about to get really bad for you. And God said this, I'm declaring the judgment of God to you. Now I'm just going to tell you something that God is reaching for His people and everything I've said, I I kind of hope it wrinkled your feathers a little bit. I kind of hope it brought you to a place where you said, I've got to get closer to God because I don't want to miss it. But what I am telling you today is that we've got to get in the deep part of the water. We've got to get into to the deep where the Spirit of God is flowing, where we hear the voice of God. And I'm telling you, there are some crazy times that are coming. And God might use you in crazy ways. And He might speak crazy things through you. I'll tell you, I just know from experience that that might happen. But I'm telling you that every one of us, when we come and say, Lord, You do with me what You will. When we get to that point, we're saying, God, I'm going to get into that deep water. And I'm going to let You be God in my life. Praise the Lord. Why don't You stand with me? I apologize right now for any of my flesh that got into this. I apologize right now. I just hope that God ministered to each each of those that are here and on video. I don't even know how to close this down other than to say, I just want to invite everybody to come to this altar, and I want you to find a place to set your life before God. I want you to find a place where you can feel the Spirit of God moving, where you feel that river of living water cascading over you because you've got to get into the deep. Praise God. Why don't you come to the altar today? Why don't you come and find a place to pray? There's not more God up here than there is back there, but what's up here is a place where you've said, okay, whatever I've got to do, I'll surrender, I'll submit. I, I will make a move toward you, God. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I do worship.